Ever since we discovered biology some 5,000 years ago, we've been wrestling with our consciousness, our anatomy, our physiology. And we've been asking the question, what does it mean to be human? In other words, who am I? None of us know the answer. I mean, we could go around this room right now and we could ask for the definition of humanity, but we don't know. We've lost the answer. And yet, the advertisers, the self-help bloggers, the drug industry, they're all trying to tell you who you are. They're all trying to tell you what to love and what to like and what to appreciate and what to be grateful for. Now, the Reformation said, I think, therefore I am. But today, we have thinking computers and we have thinking cell phones. Are they human? We would also argue that people in a coma don't think. So are they not human? Or an unborn child doesn't think. And then we strip their humanity away. We no longer say it's a baby, it's a human. We just say it's a lump of cells, it's chemistry. So what does it mean to be human? We've lost that meaning, haven't we? In 2021, we live in a globalized society. And for as much as we gain with every new passing invention, we become more and more woke. And at the same time, we lose the answer more and more to what it means to be human because we've lost the authority. We've lost the place where we find answers about our identity. Where do we go to for answers? Like we looked at the past two weeks, it used to be the Bible, sola scriptura, Scripture alone was our authority. And now, now it's whoever has the most money or the most power. Nope, not anymore. Now the authority is with whoever has the most information. And who has the most information? The internet. Hey, where'd you learn that? Oh, I read it on the internet. What the printing press did for the world the internet has done even more, and it's done it faster. The Reformation said scripture was the authority. But tell me something, where is the authority today? Here's a real question someone asked out on the internet. I found this uh, this week. The question says, are humans just a bag of chemicals and are all our thoughts, emotions, and actions just a bunch of chemical reactions? Here's the answer. If we are just a bunch of chemical reactions, then nothing we say, do, believe, or think, or anything but a bunch of chemical reactions. It also means that we shouldn't expect our thoughts, beliefs, or sensory perceptions to correlate with reality. We only see what those chemical reactions make us see, hear, smell, feel, and think. We're not just robots, but stupid robots. At least with real robots, there's an intelligent designer doing the programming. If we're just biochemical reactions, then we are programmed by unintelligent atoms and subatomic particles. Atoms and subatomic particles don't think or feel, they just exist and react. Tell me something. Why was this the answer? Because like the writer says, without an intelligent designer, we are all just stupid robots. And you could say, I'm not a stupid robot. Sure you are. Because the drug industry has shown that we can even be programmed. Can't we? Sure. If you feel one way, all you got to do is take a pill and you'll feel a different way. How can you argue that you're not just a sack of chemical reactions? If I can drop a pill or give you a shot and change you. What does it mean to be human? Big Pharma says you're a big pile of chemical reactions and they alone hold the answers to your health. TV and media says you're a consumer. They don't see you as a human either, just a dollar sign. The government only cares about you when it's election time. You're not human, you're just a voter that puts them in power. Your job, your career, that used to be a place where you found some self-worth, but today you're an employee number. You're replaceable. You're expendable. 
Phrenologists claim that they can tell what type of person you are, or you will be, by checking out the bumps on your skull. Graphologists claim they can read your character through your handwriting. Physiognomists claim that they can read your character by the shape of your nose, the set of your jaw, the texture of your skin. What does it mean to be human? What's the truth? That's what we're looking at this winter at Walden Church. We don't care what the world says. What does God say? His truth is the only truth I care about, the God's honest truth. 1 John 3 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. See, the Bible says, I know who you are. Who are you? You are a child of God. You are children of God. You are dearly loved by your heavenly Father. C.S. Lewis, he put it this way, remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature, which if you saw it now, you would strongly be tempted to worship or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are in some degree helping each other to one or other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities, it is with awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. You know what the world says? Enjoy life, right? Do whatever you want. Do what feels good. Why? Because you only live once. Nobody lives forever. Guess what? That's a lie. That's a lie. And it's one of the lies of this age. My friend, you are no mere mortal. You are a child of God. And because of that, it doesn't really matter what people see when they look at you because our Heavenly Father only sees his child. The world may not recognize it. They might not even appreciate it. But that is what you are if you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And listen, if you want to overcome the darkness that looms over you, if you want to change, if you want to rid yourself of the shackles that hold you back, then you need to embrace your godly heritage as a child of God. First John says, God is your father. How do you see him? It's important. Is God your master and you the slave? Or is he the father and you the child? That's important to answer. Because when you answer that, it helps you understand what it means to be human. How you see yourself. And your perspective makes a real difference in how you relate to God. If he's a ruthless dictator then religion is oppressive and then you're going to try to avoid God your whole life. But if he's a loving father, then you want to please him and your faith becomes helpful. Verse 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now and what will we be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. The Bible says when Jesus returns, we're going to be just like him. Romans 8, 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many others. You see, the world can't tell you who you are, because the world doesn't know who you are. It can't see the real you. The world can't see you like Jesus, because when Jesus comes, everybody will then see you for who you really are, a holy and pure child of God. Verse 3 says, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. That means when you know who you are 
And when you know what you're becoming, it's going to make a difference in the way you live your life. That's the way it was when God saved you. You were disfigured and discarded by the world. You were beaten. You were left on the side of the road. But God saw something in you that nobody else saw, and he adopted you, and he gave you new life in his Son. 2 Corinthians says all of us who reflect the Lord's glory with an unveiled face are being transformed into his own image from one degree of glory to another. This too is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It's a process. You are, you are not chemicals and biology. You are breath and light. And God is in the process of removing darkness and he's healing all of the scars and wounds that hide that beauty. Everything about you is changing, but not to become more and more like the world, but to become more and more like Jesus. For me, that's what it means to be human. It's being a loved child of God. It's being in this process of becoming more and more like Christ. Believe it. Because that's the truth. Believe it and then live it. Claim it as your own. Because if you don't, the Bible says the opposite is also true. Verse 4 says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is breaking God's law. This book the one that used to be the authority of the world, the one that used to tell people how to think, what to believe, who to be, this is why the world pokes holes in it. But that same book also says in verse 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Jesus came to take away the sin, literally to lift them up and out of your life. You see, when you trust him as your savior, he not only takes the penalty of your sin, he also takes the power of sin away. You don't have to sin anymore. Before you knew Christ, you were in bondage to sin. You didn't have a choice but to obey your sin. But now that you know Christ, you are no longer in bondage to sin, and you can now choose to obey God. Verse 6 says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. See, this is why the world can't tell you who you are. Because the world outside and sin is a byproduct of ignorance and blindness. You see, that's what this book of truth says. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Literally. All who dwell in him are not sinning. In other words, you cannot dwell in Christ and in sin at the same time. In the war of what it means to be human, you, my friend, you are in the middle. When you neglect your relationship with your heavenly father, you sin. But when you dwell in Christ, you live free. John 15, 4 says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. You have a choice. You have a choice. You can dwell in sin or you can dwell in Christ. What will you choose? Whom is your authority? Who decides your identity? Please choose Jesus. You see, abiding in Christ is not something you do. It's a place to be. It's being in Christ. A child of God dwells in Christ. It's living your life with the conscious awareness of his presence. And when you do that, you can live free of sin. So if you want to overcome the sin that's in your life, choose to dwell in Christ and then embrace your identity as a child of God. Embrace your identity as a child of God. 1 John 3 says, Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Who are you? Who are you? You are righteous. You are a member of the family. Your real family, God's family. God is your father. Your adoption defines who you are. Not your circumstances, not your DNA. You are a loved child of God, and you are in the process of becoming more and more like Christ. Please believe it and live it. 
and then live your life so thankful for it. First Thessalonians says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Psalm 107 says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Ephesians 5 says, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We hear it all the time. The importance of being thankful, gratitude. And this is probably a good time right now to roll your eyes and, and say, look at that. Pfft, Pastor David is trying to, trying to work Thanksgiving into the message at the last minute. Trust me, this fits. Because in many ways, as a society, we have lost touch with the true meaning of gratitude. And that's understandable. Because gratitude requires reflection and stillness. Two things that can be hard to find in a busy and overstimulated world. As a result, you're also missing out on all the benefits of gratitude which may be greater than many people realize. As it turns out, the effects of gratitude can be more helpful to our physiology and our health over any chemical or substance or drug. Are you hearing me? Gratitude is a natural, biblical, truthful remedy. What can gratitude help me with? How about improved mental health? If you're struggling with anxiety or depression, gratitude might be the last thing on your mind. But as it turns out, gratitude could be a key component in helping you with your mental health. One study showed that participants who wrote gratitude letters regularly displayed significantly better mental health than those who didn't. In fact, brain scans suggest that gratitude might even have the power to rewire brains permanently. How about improved physical health? Sure, we'd all like that. How about better sleep? How about immunity? Yes, please. And gratitude doesn't require a prescription or a visit to the doctor's office. Tonight, you're gonna to see 10 commercials for drugs before you fall asleep, or you're gonna see a commercial for that car that you need. But there's no commercial that's gonna say, be thankful for what you already have. And as you go to sleep, you're going to go to sleep anxious and worried. And you're going to pop a pill to make you fall asleep. But gratitude has been shown to help with both good sleep and a strong immune system. And it's even linked to reduced pain and improved cardiovascular health as well. Number four, gratitude can even help create stronger social bonds between people, stronger friendships. As we're all coming out of our COVID hidey holes, and relearning how to be around people again, let's all remember that people like to be appreciated. So expressing your gratitude makes it real to you and, the, and it benefits the other person. It is also tied to your physical and mental well-being. And most importantly, expressing your gratitude often builds connections and improves your relationships. Five, how about resilience? Gratitude has the effect of helping us to refocus all of our positive emotions. We become more optimistic, more solution oriented How does resilience help? Well, resilience improves our overall quality of life by enabling us to bounce back when we face a hardship. So what is it? What is gratitude? I mean, isn't it just being thankful? Gratitude is a sense of appreciating how much we have and not taking those blessings for granted. When a person has very little, but feels that they have so much, that is gratitude. It's like when a person only has a few coins in their pocket, but then they get a free meal and they feel grateful. They don't have to practice being grateful in that moment. When the food somehow appears and they can put it in their stomach, they will just automatically feel grateful in that moment. But for the person who already has a lot, it can be harder to feel grateful. Because if your belly is already full and then somebody gives you a free meal, it doesn't mean as much to you. So when you don't practice gratefulness, and when you don't see life as such a blessing, it's generally because we have so much and we take it for granted. 
and then we are missing out on contentment. Is this bad? Well, if someone gives you something and you receive it without gratitude, who loses? You do. Because gratitude makes you feel good. It's very heartwarming and you feel like, oh, life is beautiful. I'm happy. But to experience the benefits of gratitude, then you have to practice gratitude regularly. Because it, is just, it doesn't just come automatically for us. We tend to see ourselves as a, as a construct of body and mind, and we allow ourselves to be a slave to our emotions. For example, we see ourselves in terms of, I'm happy, or I'm sad. Or when I look in the mirror, I see myself as, I'm Irish, I'm German, I'm tall, I'm short, I'm fat, I'm skinny. Or we look at our bank account and we say, I'm rich, I'm poor. That's not what it means to be human. Like we're saying, we tend to see ourselves as the chemical construct more than the fortunate child of God that we are. So you have to remind yourself every day, I am so lucky. I am so lucky to be alive. I am lucky to have this life. I am lucky to have this home, lucky to have this car. How lucky am I to have these kids? How lucky am I to have this pet? How lucky am I to have my health? It takes effort to recognize how lucky you are. If you're in the process of looking for ideas on how to practice gratitude, let me give you five. Five ways you can practice gr gratitude on a daily basis. Okay, number one, set aside some time and just make a list. It doesn't have to be a real list. You can make a list in your head, right? Make a list in your head, start with the tiniest details, and then mention them in your prayers. Say them out loud. Mention them in your prayers. Tell God how grateful you are for these things. Why? So that whenever you're feeling empty, whenever you're feeling lost or unsure of yourself, you can just recall this mental list and improve your mood. Author Anne Voskamp said, when I give thanks for the seemingly microscopic, I make a place for God to grow within me. Two, please remember to say thank you. Say thank you. Tell other people thank you when they do something nice for you, no matter how small. You know, we used to have more polite people in the world, didn't we? <laughs> the world used to be more polite. We need to say thank you more. And we need to learn just to let the little things go. Number three, you do you. Now, what I mean by that is, don't allow other people's bitterness or their negativity or any other outward circumstance to influence your inner peace. Look for the best in everyone and then just believe the best about them. We can't be responsible for how the world acts or feels, but you don't have to pick up those signs of negativity and march along with everybody else. It's possible to be grateful, even when you're surrounded by negativity and self-centeredness. Number four, anger, disappointment, failure, frustration, those things will always be a part of life but don't let them become your default emotion. Don't be complacent and resign yourself to being a victim. I'm so sick of the whining and complaining and the oh, woe is me attitude lately. Everyone's a victim. Everyone's hurt and wounded and insulted and appalled. That is not a healthy way to live. Don't be that person. Choose to live from a place of gratitude and you'll have more peace. You know why we all love Thanksgiving and Christmas? And yes, even the 4th of July. Because those holidays remind us all that living with gratitude is better than the alternative. On a birthday, we say, we are all blessed to have you. The 4th of July says, we are all blessed to live in America. Thanksgiving says, we're all blessed to have food and family. Christmas says, we're all blessed to have a Savior who loves us and rescues us. And then we say, I wish I could live this way all year through. Guess what? 
you can. Number five, just begin to build gratitude all around you with small, daily, unexpected, undeserved acts of love. Show compassion, show grace, show forgiveness. Isn't that how Jesus lived? Isn't that how Jesus instructed us to live? When Jesus was showing us what it looks like to be human, this is how Jesus defined the answer. I have found the more I thank God, the more I feel close to God, and the less these little things seem to bother me. First Thessalonians 5 says, give thanks in all circumstances. A life lived in gratitude connects us with God and each other in very powerful ways. What can you be thankful for? Let me help you start your own list. I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. I was hopeless, but not anymore. I was alone, now I have friends. God has placed us on a planet and in a country where we all have clean air, clean water, we have food, shelter, we have the opportunity for employment. We must be thankful that God has placed us in a country where men and women have sacrificed to provide us with great freedom, freedom to worship God as we see fit. And then I create those reminders of gratitude so that when I find myself lost or hopeless or alone, I am reminded that God will save me because I am his. He is my father. God has inspired me, moved me, provided for me, known me, saved me. God has blessed me beyond all comprehension and taught me how to laugh and love and live. And I am so thankful to be human. And I am so thankful to be his child. Let's pray together. Lord, may we never lose what it means to be human. May we never lose what it means to be your creation. And as we sit here, as a child of God, loved by you, Lord, we just pray that each and every day we would draw closer to what it means to be more like your son, to follow his example, to live each day with a grateful heart, showing love and compassion to those in our lives. May we never forget. May the authority of my life always be your word. May I always return to it to find truth. Truth about myself and truth about the world you made. And when I leave this building, I am still your church. And it is still my job to speak truth. And it is still my job to show love. It is still my job to speak grace. Because I am human. And I am yours. Amen. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Of course, I want to remind you that we are here. We are here. We are physical. We are present we have worship services. People come in, they sit, and they sing, and they learn, and they laugh, and they love, and we want you to be a part of it. Please return to church. Create this habit in your life once again. This is where we grow together, and when you are not here, you cannot bless us, and we cannot bless you. We want to bless you. We want to be the church where you live. Every Sunday morning we have two services, one at 9.30. It's a traditional service and we have a choir and we sing hymns. We also have a service at 11 o'clock. It's more contemporary and we have a worship team. Also at 11 o'clock we have a children's program and we also have youth group. We even have youth group on Wednesdays. Every Wednesday you can send your son or daughter on their bike, on their skateboard. You can walk them over, drive them over. We're close. We're in the neighborhood. We're here. Send them over at 6 p.m. We will even feed them dinner. And then we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. We love you guys. We're here for you. I'll see you next week. Bye.